so I'm getting on in years, and I've been working on finalizing my own advanced directive. Surveys have shown that I don't remember the number, but it's north of 60% of people, when asked, say they would prefer to die at home, not hooked up to all kinds of tubes and wires and machines that go beep. I don't know what experience you have had with the medical system, but my experience is if something is possible, and there's no one around to say no, they will do it, regardless of what your quality of life will be during the procedure or the treatment, what the prospects of improvement afterwards, that's not a consideration. Your quality of life is up to you rather than quantity. The way to do that is to have an advanced directive. It's a legal document that tells medical people what your wishes are about your medical care. Now, there's all sorts of forms that you can get from the state, from the hospital, all sorts of places have blank advanced directives. Some of them are moderately good. Some of them are not a whole lot of help. But there's an organization, national organization, one of their main objectives is to empower patients to take charge of their health care, to avoid unwanted <coughs> treatments. And they have recommendations as to how to do that. And as they say, one of the best ways of doing that is having an advanced directive. Now, aside from stating choices under certain situations you can name, you can also name an agent or surrogate that you empower to make medical decisions for you if you're not able to. This is an excellent thing to have done. If you don't have an agent named, there are laws that state who has precedence. If you're married and your spouse is living, your spouse is the first choice. But it's sort of like inheritance. After that, it goes down this tree. Children, parents, in-laws, whatever. And you have no control over that. If you know that you have a, a sister and you don't agree about medical care, she just might end up taking care, making decisions about your medical care if you don't name an agent other than her. So naming an agent can be very important. Even if you have an advanced directive that says, for instance, you don't want advanced life care. If you're not able to make a decision and say you have three kids and two of them are, are willing to honor your advanced directive and the third is no, 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 got to do everything to keep them alive. Guess who the medical system is apt to listen to? Just what you don't want. So naming uh, an agent can be very important to see that your wishes are carried out. 
Now, this organization that I referred to earlier is called CompassionAndChoices.org. Just I, either in September, I think it was September, they went live on their website with two tools that can be useful in settling questions about dementia, particularly Alzheimer's. They have a sort of a questionnaire that helps you prepare if you know you're going to talk to a doctor about dementia, either because you're worried about getting it in the future or you've been diagnosed with it but you're still rational so far. It lays out a bunch of questions that you could ask and get answers to. They also have a values tool which describes the different stages of Alzheimer's. And there's about 15 stages, uh, milestones, if you will. And you have, I think it's five choices as what you would like at that milestone if you have dementia. And they range from business as usual, to withholding, because this is what you asked for, nutrients and hydration. And if you don't know, that typically leads in about two weeks to your death. Alzheimer's is a very cruel way to die, both for the patient and the family that's trying to take care of them. And yes, it will kill you eventually. But getting there is a real rocky road. And if you look at this tool and say, at this point, when I get to this point, I want to cut it off. This provides you with the words to put into your advanced directive to hopefully make that happen. I have the URL for both of these. See me and I can give them to you. Now the forms for an advanced directive that you get from the hospital or so forth typically don't include several things that you should include. One is a dementia provision. Another, you don't know when or where you're going to be when you get slapped into an emergency room. It may be a hospital that's sponsored by a religious organization that have prohibitions about what they will and won't do, regardless of what your advanced directive says. So you need a provision in your advanced directive that directs that if you end up in an institution that won't honor your advanced directive, you shall be moved to another institution that will honor your directive. That should be in your directive. Also, you can put in a visitation directive. Now, I don't know if any of you people are in same-sex partnerships, but for them, this is crucial. And it can be important to other people, too. If you have somebody that you absolutely want to get into you that's not family, You need to name them and say, they shall be admitted. If you have a relative that you don't want to see no matter what, you can put that in there too.
And you can include a clause saying that if anyone visiting you creates chaos or conflict, that upon your, if you're capable, or your agent, if they have to take it, can be excluded from seeing you. This can be important. Now, you've probably all heard of patients who can't communicate. They call this being locked in. And there are people who arrive in this situation but appear that inside this individual there's a consciousness aware but unable to communicate. This is my motivation for my presentation tonight. I think us hams have an ace in the hole as far as this is concerned. At least those of us who knows Morse code. It's possible, maybe not very probable, but it's possible that somebody who knows Morse code and is locked in would be able to wiggle a finger, blink their eyes, wag their tongue, in some other way indicate they're trying to send Morse code. But medical people aren't going to be looking for that. So I have written a paragraph, and I've got some copies of this if anybody's interested, that I plan to include in my advanced directive. If ever I appear to have lapsed into a non-communicative state, I desire that my caregivers, and most especially my surrogate, be alert to the possibility that any periodic and or rhythmic motion, hand, foot, tongue, eye, etc., may be an attempt on my part to communicate via Morse code. Such, must such motions be seen, it is my desire that, that a person with knowledge of Morse code be brought to my bedside to observe the action and possibly interpret the message. If it is confirmed that I'm trying to use Morse code to communicate, I desire that a code key operable by me, practice sounder and decoder be provided so that non-Morse code literate persons can read my messages. One possible source of code literate persons and the items listed above might be the Albemarle Amateur Radio Club, and I give the website an email. As of, fill in a date, a space to fill in a name, has agreed to be a contact person for such a request. So I'm asking that the club assign this responsibility to an officer such that if they ever get a request, they will find a member who is Morse code literate to go to the hospital and witness what the patient is doing. And if he can detect Morse code, to interpret the message. And also, for the tinkerers in the club, it might be possible to construct the device that the patient would be able to use to send Morse code, and the decoder would show it in text that any medical person could read. Yeah, the so code practice oscillated about under $100. MFJ and others made code, code to text, LCD. Yeah. And uh, I thought I've seen them like a 20 or 30 character for more like 25, but I, I didn't go up and look for it. But so this is two asks of the club, one that they set up this contact person, and that if possible, supply the device. 
Thank you. Thank you. Sir.